Turn with me again tonight to Titus chapter 1. And um, I hope you sort of bear with me for a few minutes as we get started. Um, I may seem just a bit repetitious just for a few minutes. And um, we're just going to pick up where we were uh, a couple weeks ago. In Titus chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Father, thank you, Lord. We sure appreciate the beautiful weather. Lord, it feels like spring is here. And um, Lord, we just appreciate um, the ability to be here. Um, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for all that we've enjoyed in this day. We thank you for the songs that we have been able to sing this evening. And uh, Lord, we pray now, uh, that you would guide us and help us. We pray that you would make it exceedingly helpful, Lord, um, in, in view of um, all that the devil is trying to do and all that will be happening in the days ahead of us. And um, Lord, especially to our young people, although, Lord, none of us are exempt. God, we pray that you bless the truth. We pray, Lord, it would be lodged steadfast in our heart. And God, we would have a loyalty to your truth, Lord, that would carry us all the way till you come. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I don't have the verse in front of me, but there's a verse in the prophets where the Lord said to um, one of the prophets, he said, they are not valiant for the truth. And valiant is, um, it's a war term. It's a battle term. And uh, God looked down at his people at that particular point in time, and he said, you know, they're you know, they're probably probably um, really zealous about some things. But he said, but they are not valiant for the truth. Um, you know, we were talking um, two weeks ago, and we were talking about um, imaginary Christianity. You know, we were talking about how, you know, it starts with a rejection of preaching. And, and of course, you know, that's mentioned there. Um, and we wound up talking about the law of God. And we talked about, you know, the law of gravity. And, uh, you know, just the, the law of the speed limit law. We gave some illustrations of, of that and how, um, you know, that stuff, when you think of the word law, you think of something very fixed, very rigid, a clear line. It's black and white. Uh, there's very little give. And um, we talk, uh, talked about how um, imaginary Christianity, you know, they, they, don't, they don't want anything to do with the law. You know, they're, they're, the drum they beat is, you know, we're not under law, we're under grace. And, uh, and they make that mean something that it doesn't mean. You know, Titus 2, the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2, uh, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So grace, grace never becomes... A, a ticket to, you know, um, you know, just erase the law of God and pretend it doesn't exist for us. You know, for the sinner, the law's purpose is to show them their sin. Uh, Paul said, I had not known sin, but by the law. He said, by the law is the knowledge of sin. But for the believer, it is the mind of God. It tells us, you know, how God feels, what he thinks, uh, what he wants. And to us, um, you know, that carries the thought of... Um, you know, this is what he wants us to do. You remember Paul on the Damascus Road, the first question he asked was, who art thou, Lord? And we got that settled. The second question was, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? We, uh, we talked about uh, the law of God and gave a lot of examples. You know, um, one of the great preachers of, of days gone by, 
is uh, a guy by the name of Charles Finney. And um, a lot of these guys, whether it was Charles Finney or whether it was George Whitfield or whether it was the Wesley brothers or whether it was some of those other guys, you know, they, um, they maybe all didn't agree just exactly on every jot and tittle. Um, but you cannot read their history without realizing that they were unbelievably used of God. And Charles Finney became known as a great revival preacher. One of the things that all those guys had in common, including even uh, the guys uh, that were Calvinists, for example, um, George Whitfield would have fallen on the Calvinist side of that fence. Uh, you know, J.C. Ryle, a, a lot of guys, uh, they all agreed on one point. One of the points they agreed was that it was the preaching of the law that brought conviction of sin. They believed that you could not justifiably hold up the cross until you held up the law. They had no use for the cross. They didn't understand how great God's love. They didn't understand the need of the sacrifice until they understood their guilt before God. In Romans chapter 3, it says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. And you know, when you're dealing with lost people, if you can find a way in that conversation to steer them to the law, suddenly... You know, this thing about salvation makes sense. And this thing of going to hell makes sense. You know, lost people have real trouble understanding why a loving God would send anybody to hell and how hell could be forever. And they just it just blows their mind that, you know, that that could even be reasonable. Well, it's not reasonable until you begin to understand and apply the law. And the law has been broken and it's a holy God who lives forever. And the only way that that law can be satisfied is through a perfect substitute. And when they reject that perfect substitute, they must accept the penalty of that broken law, which God has told us what that is. So as you begin to witness to people, if you could communicate that to them, suddenly it begins to make sense. You know, Ray Comfort uh, has, you know, some of you are familiar with him and, and, uh, and his, uh, his approach is really, really good. And, um, you know, he said often sinners will say, uh, you know, well, well, you know, I've, I've, I've really been a pretty good person. And so then he begins to walk them through the law. Have you, have you ever told a lie? Yes. Well, what do you call somebody that tells a lot lie? They'll go a liar. They'll say, yeah, you know, have you, uh, have you ever taken God's name in vain? You know, have you ever pinched your finger in the door and said, Oh, blankety blank and said God's name in vain. And they'll say, yeah. He'll say, you know, you probably don't know this, but that's in the Ten Commandments. And, and it says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That's blasphemy. That's the God that made you, the God that made all things, the God that holds your life in his hand. And you have cursed him in that moment. He said, it's, it's a very severe offense to him. He'll say, have you ever stolen something even, even real small, maybe when you, were, when you were little? And, of course, he always says that, you know, because nobody wants to admit they've stolen anything recently. And... Um, and they'll say, oh, yeah. And he'll say, so, so what do you call a person that steals things? And they'll go, a thief? And they'll say, yeah, a thief. He'll say, have you ever looked with lust? You know, Jesus said, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. Have you ever looked with lust? And, and, you know, whether it be man or woman, very sheepishly, they'll usually smile and say, yeah. And he said, so he'll say this, by your own admission. You're a lying, thieving, blasphemous adulterer. So what is God going to do with you on the day of judgment? And some of them will say, wow, I, I guess. He'll say, he'll say, if he was going to put you in heaven or hell, which would it be? And they say, well, and here's what. If he judges me by that standard, then I guess I'm going to hell. And he says, yeah, that's right. That's right. Charles Finney, when he preached, one of the things that he preached that absolutely brought revival, both to the lost and to the saved, he would come into a church and he would begin to press the people.
that they must immediately submit to the law of God. You know how most people are, and, and really a lot of us are, we, we know what's right and wrong, we know what God says, and, and you know what we think? We think, well, you know, I'm, I'm not doing so good in this area, I'm not so good, so good in that area. You know, I'm doing pretty good in these five things over here, but you know, uh, you know I, 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 I know I need to fix that, and so, so I'll, I'll work on it. I'll work on it. Charles Finney never accepted that approach. He said, it's not about you working on it. He said, it's not about you fixing it when it suits you or gradually easing into it. And he would begin to hammer those people from the pulpit that they, if they wanted to be right with God, they must submit entirely and immediately this day. And man, he would absolutely get intimidated in the way he pressed the crowd that you must submit tonight. And you know, a lot of people did. And whenever they started doing that, revival broke out. Can you imagine? I want you to look at Psalm 112. Psalm 112. We're talking about real Christianity. Psalm 112. You know, we have a Christianity that has arisen that somehow the the law of the Lord and even the words, even the word law has become a dirty word for most of professing, even Bible believing Christianity. Why don't you look at Psalm 112 verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in His commandments. You know, there's a blessing. There's a blessing for the person that delights greatly. You know, it's funny. He he didn't just say that 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 gives it a good shot. He said he said that delights, but he went even further. That delights greatly in the law of the Lord. And I know what you know. I know what some people say. They'll say, "Well, brother Newman, you know." You know, that's true and, and that's good, and we're glad David felt that way, but you know that that's Old Testament, you know. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about that as we roll along tonight. Um, again, we mentioned uh, I want you to go there tonight. I want you to go to John 14 for a moment. John 14. I think we uh, we closed out with this verse a couple Sunday nights ago, John 14, verse 15. You know, even the people that don't like uh, you know, um, what we would call Bible Christianity, uh, that they, the, okay, I'm just going to say it, okay? I hate the term, and it's, and it's all wrong, and I think you know that, but we're, we'll just call it this, old school Christianity. The people that, that really despise old school Christianity, and I'm talking about that still think that they're, they're evangelical Christians, but they despise old school Christianity. You know, you could ask them the question, well, it's all about loving Jesus, isn't it? And they would heartily agree, heartily agree. But what does that look like? Look at John 14, verse 15. Jesus said, if ye love me, play the music a little louder, turn the lights down, have warm fuzzies, and say my name about a thousand times and call me the Almighty over and over and over. Is that what it says? Jesus said, you say you love me. He said, but there is a way that I will know and that you can know, and it's infallible. You know, I think this is the only time Jesus ever said this. Would you look at verse 21? I'm telling you what, man, Jesus beat this drum a lot. I don't know. You know, we have this generation that doesn't read the Bible. But if you read the Bible, it's amazing what you see. Look at verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. Boy, a lot of love going on there. And will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, what I want you to notice, you know, is the context 
Jesus really is hitting that hard through this passage. But notice the context. Look what's found in these verses. Look at um, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. Boy, there's a promise about being able to do something great for the Lord. Look at verse 13. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, boy, there's, there's a big promise about answered prayer. Look at verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. There's a promise about his presence. Look at verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. There's, there's that ability to recognize truth. Verse 20, at that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He says, I will give you a knowing, an ability to know some things. And in the midst of all that, several times, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's almost like all these things are all tied together. Look with me, if you would, at the next chapter, John 15. John 15, verse 10. John 15, verse 10. If you've got a, a Bible with the words of Christ written in red, all these, these, this, these pages are just red, red, red. I mean, it's just all the words of Jesus Christ. John 15, verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as, kept, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that I might hem in your life and make you feel very much in bondage. That's not what he says, is it? What does he say comes along with you keeping his commandments? These things have I spoken unto you, verse 11, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Verse 14. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Verse 17, these things I command you, that ye love one another. Wow. You, you know, it almost seems like he's trying to get something crossed, doesn't it? You know, imaginary Christianity has suggestions and feelings and opinions, but they have no fear and they have no law and they have no commandments. You know, um, in, in you, you know, we, we often mention this, you have the spirit of Christ. OK, um, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You know. Um, part of our Christianity is a secret that was hid from the ages, which is Christ in you. Um, and so what is that? What is what is the spirit of Christ in you? You know, Jesus said in John eight about his father. He said, I do always those things that please him. Say, so, are you a Christian? You'd say, yes, sir. Is, is Jesus in your heart? You'd say, yes, sir. Um, I mean, you know what that spirit does, don't you? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have 23 different approaches. It, it doesn't modify itself. It's always the same. I do always those things that please him. This is real Christianity. All else is a substitute. You know, I talked about, uh, um, you know, last time I talked about climbing into that simulator in that, in that mall. And I said it was a roller coaster simulator. And, uh, and I really liked that because I knew I'd be safe in there. And I, I got in that thing. And wow, I had the ride of my life. It was, it was a ride. I would do it again. And I would, even if it was better quality, I'd just jump right in. I just loved it because I was safe. But I'm telling you what, man, I got in there. And I don't know if, uh, if they put goggles on me. You know, they have those virtual reality. I, I stepped up. I got something that looks like the real deal this time. And, uh, you know, you, you put those goggles on, you know, you can get those goggles. And, and all of a sudden, you are in another world. I mean, it fills your vision. And, um, and man, it's just, it just, it's wild. I got in that thing, and man, I was, I was, it, it would go up, and of course, you know, if you're standing outside the simulator, and boy, it's interesting to hear the screams of the people that think they're going somewhere. And that thing tilts, and you're like this, and in the screen, you're going down, and you're going back up, and, and you're hearing the sounds, and, 
And you know what? Visually, it begins to play tricks on you. And literally, it, it literally, you feel the adrenaline. It literally feels like you're riding a roller coaster. The only difference is the wind. I use this illustration in Lethbridge. Somebody came up to me after church and said, oh, pastor. He said, now they've got the wind. I said, oh, really? He said, oh, yeah. He said, you come diving down, and they've got this thing that blows the air. And they said, it's even more real than it's ever been. So it, it looks real, and it feels real, and it sounds real, but is it real? It's only a mental image. The experience, was it an experience? It was. But it only existed between my ears. It wasn't real. There's a lot of Christianity that has no commandments. And they go to church. Man, they got the visual. And, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not knocking having, you know, you know, but but you know you know what I'm saying. I, I I guess I I am knocking the black ceiling and the bright lights and the smoke and all that stuff where they got to make it look like a rock concert or a bar. I, I decide that just has no place in the in in the with a holy God and a holy Savior, He that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. That has no place in Christianity. None. But you know what? You know what they're getting? They're getting the experience. I got a relative. It was in one of those services not long ago. And she was in a, she was in a bad place in her life. And um, she told me, she said, oh, it was just so nice to go in there. And she said, I just melted into the crowd, into the darkness. And she said, I just heard that music and I just closed my eyes. And she said, oh, it just, oh, and here's where it gets really spiritual. It just ministered to me. You know what she got? She put on the goggles. And she had an experience. Was it real Christianity? No. It only existed between her ears. If you want an experience, devil's got one for you. You ever talk to somebody that's dropped acid? Yeah, they dropped acid. What's that, preacher? <laughs> You know, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the old hallucinatory drugs, and it's still around, was a drug called LSD, and they called it acid. The, the people that used acid, it was, they, they called it dropping acid. And, um, and man, they would hallucinate. They would hallucinate. And, um, and I, I talked to a guy that had been saved out of all that. And, uh, man, I heard a lot of people died on acid because uh, you know, some of them would blow their brains right out, but some of them it never did. Some of, it could use, some of it could go on hundreds of acid trips, and it never did blow their brain. Now, it damaged them, but, you know, they, they survived it. Other people, man, first time their brain was shot. But what killed a lot of them was, was they started to experience, now you get this, another reality. And they'd be they'd be somewhere and they'd be in a building and they'd be they'd be in a house in the third story and they just had this feeling come over them that they could fly. And suddenly they looked at their body and they had wings. And you don't know how many of those people jumped to their death. This guy I was talking to you, I said, I said, don't you I said, when you're when you're in that state, I said, do you realize it's fake? He said, you do. But he said, the problem is after a while, it overrides even your judgment. And then you start thinking it's real. Oh, preacher, they're singing about Jesus. It just blessed my heart. It just. <sighs> you know what just happened? The devil just dropped you some acid. And he's going to take you far from God. He's going to take you. Paul said, but I fear. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Who did he say this to? The most carnal church in your Bible, Corinth. Which, by the way, was the same church that he challenged them on, your, on their salvation. He closed the 2 Corinthians 13 with, this, with these words. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. He said, there's a bunch of you. I don't even know if you're saved or not. That's what Paul said. He said, but I fear as the serpent beguiled Eve through a subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted. 
from the simplicity that's in Christ. For if he that cometh bringeth another Jesus, or another spirit whom ye have not received, he said, I fear that you will bear with him. No commandments. No law. Look at Titus with me for a moment. Titus. And another reality. They say, oh man, preacher. You know, I, you know, I was just in that place and, you know, and, and then they get really, you know, if they'll even discuss it with you. And no normally when they have this discussion with somebody like me, after a few minutes, they figure out where I'm coming from. And I, I'm, guys, you know me. I'm as kind and gracious. I don't get smart aleck. I don't call them an idiot. I don't do any of that stuff. You know, I'll do it in the pulpit, but I don't do it in person. <laughs> really, I don't do it in person. And I'll talk to them. And as soon as they figure out I'm one of those, then they're like, oh, you grow up way back then. When Chris, you know, when they just sang those hymns, you poor, deluded old guy. <laughs> that's, that's the attitude. That's the attitude. Do you know why they do that? Because they have embraced another reality. And it seems so real to them that they think I'm the fool. Look at Titus 2. Now, I want to ask you a question. Read these, read these words real carefully with me. All right. Um, you know, verse 12, that, that passage, you know, the, uh, verse 11, the grace of God. Verse 12 teaches us these things. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. And verse 15, he says, these things speak and exhort. Now watch. And rebuke with all authority. Paul told Titus, he said, Titus, don't you let them back you down. He said, you stand with a rod in your back. You have the authority of Almighty God to, to tell them these things. Now, um, so keep that thought, rebuke with all authority. With, keep that thought and look at chapter 1, verses, um, verse 10. We're going to start there. Let me say, say something. You guys know this. Titus was left to pastor in Crete, okay? And Titus is going to start a church there. And not only is he going to start a church in Crete, he's going to actually start many churches in Crete. Okay. He's going to ordain elders in every city in Crete. But you know what? He's working with a really rough bunch of characters. Okay. Okay. Now brace, brace your socks and do not get mad at me for what I'm about to say, because it's Bible truth. You're going to see it right here. Different people groups have different characteristics by nature. Okay. Um, some people groups are very athletic. Some are not. Some, some are very spiritual. Some are very fleshy. And that is the way it is. That's reality. And so the Holy Ghost says through Paul, the Holy Ghost describes the people on Crete. And it is not nice what he says. Look at verse 10. Titus 1, verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Now watch. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans, the people on your island, Titus, they are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. He says, you can't trust them any further than you can throw them. They're a bunch of lazy bums, and they'll lie to your face every time you talk to them. There you have it. The Holy Ghost isn't afraid to tell the truth. That's only us that are afraid to tell the truth. Look at verse 13. The Holy Ghost said, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Now, boy, that, that, there's, there's rebuking, but then there's sharp rebuke. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So I got a question for you. Okay, ready? So how do you do this? How do you, re, how do you speak and reprove and exhort with all authority? How do you rebuke them sharply if these things are only suggestions? How do you do that if it's open to everybody's personal spin on it? How do you do that? If the Holy Ghost is okay with everybody changing it to suit their background 
and to suit, you know, their, their upbringing and to suit their psychological and emotional makeup and to suit their personality. I have just found it unbelievably interesting as I've read through the Gospels time and time and time again. And I've watched the Lord Jesus deal with the crowds and the individuals that came to him. And he never addresses these things. The Lord just says, this is what I want and this is the way it is. Almost sounds like law, doesn't it? I may have mentioned this last time around. But uh, there's an old preacher. Liz is not in the room. Liz, Liz and Ben Crown College, and the guy that started that place, a guy named Ralph Sexton. Ralph Sexton was a great preacher. He just died literally just a few months ago. And um, I listened to a, to a message by Ralph uh, Clarence. Clarence Sexton. Yeah, sorry about that. I got the wrong name written in my notes. I guess that happens when you get old. You write the wrong name down. Clarence Sexton. Clarence Sexton. And um, Clarence in this message, he was talking about the preachers of his youth. And he said, when I was a little boy, he said, I remember those preachers. And he said, they were, they were men of conviction. He said, they had a rod of iron in their back. Black was black and white was white. And there were lines that you never crossed and you never compromised on. And he said, it wasn't even. He said, they would fight you tooth and nail. He said, then several years passed. And he said another generation of preachers arose, and he said they really weren't men of conviction. He said they were men of beliefs. And, you know, it was much milder, and, and uh, they sort of had latitude for a lot of things. And, and uh, they had correct doctrine, but it really didn't affect the way they lived so much. And he said they were men of beliefs. But he said, but I've noticed in the last few years we don't have convictions or beliefs. We have a generation now that just has opinions. And they preach the Bible like it's to be judged by your opinion. And it's to be lived by your opinion. You know what that is? That's this. Christianity is imaginary many times. And I want to give you another, another place where it shows up. And that is this. When our forefathers don't matter. I want you to go to 1 Kings 8 with me. 1 Kings 8. You know, um, you know the mark of a cult, and we've, we've said this often. The mark of a cult is, is they, you know, they got their own holy books, you know. Many of the cults that are, that are in our land... Uh, as we as we speak, many of them have risen up in the last 200 years, many of them in the last 100 years. And. Um, the problem with that is, do you mean that nobody had it right all through history? And they show up on the scene and their 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 approach is, well, you know, everybody had it wrong for centuries but we have a new revelation, and we have it right, finally. And you know, a lot of modern Christianity is very much that way. They look back at our forefathers, uh, and, and, and um, I mean, going back, I mean, all the way into the days of the Bible. But they, they, would, they would look at, you know, the Christianity, the Bible-believing Christianity, the, guy, the, the preachers that preached when you were children that really did something for God. They look at them with disdain. And they say, well, you know, they just don't know how to reach people now. Now we have it right. Look at 1 Kings 8, verse 57. 1 Kings 8, verse 57. The Lord our God be with us. As he was with our fathers, let him not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. Go to, go to um, Psalm 44. Psalm 44. You know, Bible-believing Christianity throughout history 
uh, I mean, from the days of the apostles, really, uh, it is strikingly similar. Yeah, we drive cars and they didn't, you know, and, uh, you know, there, there are some things that are different. But, but that whole approach, that's why the book you have in your lap is still the same book that they had. Okay, um, so look at um, Psalm 44, verse 1. Psalm 44, verse 1. We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days, in the times of old. How thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantedst them. How thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword. Neither did their own arm save them. Now watch. But thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. He says, God says, I, I liked your fathers. I liked your fathers. Look at 2 Timothy 3. And I've got a list of verses on this, and we're not, you know, if, you know, I can give you more, but just for time's sake, I'm just going to give you a few. There again, somebody would say, well, pastor, you know, well, that, that's Old Testament, okay? Look at 2 Timothy 3. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Continue thou in those things, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Go to uh, 2 Peter, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2 Peter. You know, you know, Pastor, you know, we've, we've just, you know, we just, Brother Newman, we just have a new approach to this thing. Okay. Would, would our fathers have been happy with it? Would, would our grandfathers have been happy? Would they, would they embrace this? You know, I know some guys that, that got saved out of all that stuff long ago. You know, I, I got some friends that were dance band drummers and they were, they were uh, bar room guys and they were fighters and, and you know, they, they got saved out of the club scene and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, they look at this and they're going, what is this? This is what we left behind. I got a question. Oh, so you got a new way. Would the old timers be okay with it? If the answer is no, this is what you got. This is what you got. Look at 2 Peter 1, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It wasn't just a bunch of old fogies that decided to write some. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Look at Isaiah 58 for just a moment. Isaiah 58. When, um, when, the, when the new Christianity started coming in, it started coming in when I was in Bible college, man. I, oh, man, I remember some things. I could tell you stories. And, uh, you know, it, this, this isn't something that just happened in the last 10 years. It's been going on a while. You know, it just started coming in. It was just, it was giving, it was, um, there were some Christian musicians that were giving birth to it. And, uh, man, I remember, I remember the late 70s, early 80s, and, man, things were happening, and things were changing, and the music was changing. Oh, yeah, way back then. We actually had cars back then, kids. We had cars back then. We had phones, but they had cords on them. And, um, you know, uh, the, the music was changing and, and, and changing rapidly, and, and it was radical how it was changing. Now the music in, in a lot of the churches is more like um, – it's sort of new agey. It's a lot of, it's a lot of like love sound, love songs sounding stuff, um, which, and, but back in the early eighties, they had the whole spectrum. They had, uh, if you wanted it to sound like, man, I could drop names and all you young people, you wouldn't know any of the names, but, um, it's all the same stuff. They would, uh, you know, they had, they had Christian music that sounded like love songs. And, and even back then you'd listen to the words and you're thinking, are they singing to Jesus or are they singing to somebody else? Because ne they never used the word Jesus. The, oh, I love him. You know, and, and they're just, they're just doing it, you know. And then they had the whole spectrum. And if you wanted somebody that would, you know, sounded like the super hard rockers, you had Petra and Striper. How many of you remember Petra and Striper? Oh, yeah. I mean, they were like acid hard rock in Jesus' name. You had the whole spectrum. 
See, there's no, they're telling you, oh, you know, those old timers, they just don't understand. You're listening to the serpent. We do understand. We were there. We were there. Look at Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. Of course, you'll recognize these verses. I'm just going to read them to you because I want to establish the context. Isaiah 58, 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression. And the house of Jacob their sins. Now watch, verse 2. Yet, he says, he says, Isaiah, I want you to lift up your voice. And he said, I want you to preach to them. He said, I want you to preach about their sin. And he said, yet, they seek me daily. They're, they're a spiritual bunch. They go to church. They seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me ordinance of judgment, justice. They take delight in approaching to God. But in verse 3, they ask a question and they say, wherefore have we fasted and thou seest not? They, they recognize that even though they were very spiritual, trying to be, they weren't really getting anywhere with God. And so they're asking, why is that? And so Isaiah begins to tell them why. Um, look at verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore we, have, we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? And the Lord says, behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. In other words, you, they would have a day of fasting, but were they alone for hours pleading with God? No, they're, you know, they're, they're fasting and you know, and, and they're, they're walking their dog and, you know, they're playing some board games and, you know, and they're, you know, they're, they're watching the late show and, and um, they're just starving themselves. But, but this isn't really about the Lord. In the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of weakness. He says, some of you guys, you're just fasting because you're trying to one up the next guy. Well, I fasted for two days, you loser. You only fasted for one. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this? In other words, he's saying, if that's all you're doing, if you're just making this look like you're pathetic, he says, if, if this is all about looking spiritual, he says, am I supposed to accept this? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? And the Lord describes what he's interested in, to loose the bands of wickedness. I mean, you're fasting because you want to get free from some sin. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. And he goes on down. And so what the Lord's doing here, he's saying, you know, you guys, you're missing the point. You're doing this all wrong. And then he begins to describe the way he wants it done. And in so many words, the Lord's saying, if you'll do this my way, he said, I will hear you. Now, verse 11, go to verse 11. And here's one of the things the Lord will do. Now watch. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garment, garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Now watch. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of past dwelling. He said, you'll get a hold of me. And he said, I'll help you rebuild things that were lost long ago. He said, you'll be like your fathers. You'll be like your fathers. You know, something is wrong. I, and I'm not saying every person in this stuff, you know, I'm not saying all of them, their motives are some. You got people in, in this kind of Christianity. That's all they know. Uh, they were brought into it. They were invited. And you know what? Uh, I'll say this. You say, Pastor, do you think do you think God never works in somebody's heart there? No, I didn't say that. But I will say this. The God of this book will sooner or later lead them out of that. Because God 
is not there. He does not own that kind of Christianity. So he may, he may deal with them. He may save them. He may help them. But if they're following him, I was watching uh, through the years, I've watched some of the evangelical leaders and, um, and, you know, their music is usually pretty raunchy. And I've watched a few of them. And, you know, it, you know, that's always a dilemma for some people. And they'll say, oh, but, you know, they're such a good guy. But their music's so bad. And how do you reconcile that? And you know what? I, I don't have to reconcile that. That's not that's I just know what the Bible says. But I do know this. I watch some of them. And you know what God always does? He does the same thing for them. He does for you. Are you wrong in some area? God begins to deal with you. He's, he's trying to make you into the image of his son. He's trying to continue the work that he's begun. He's trying to make you holier. And so he begins to move you and pull and convict and move and move. And I've watched some of these guys. There's a few of them. And they have slowly but surely moved in the right direction. You know what's happening? The same God that's in you. The same H-O-L-Y. The same Holy Ghost is leading them along the path of holiness. And they're realizing, I can't stay where I am. I must go forward. Real quick, I want to give you two more things. Look at, um, look at Job 31. Job 31. The, Christi the Christianity that the devil is trying to bring in you know, and it's, man, it's the Christianity that rejects preaching more and more. It, 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 it rejects the law of God. Um, it rejects our, it rejects our forefathers. I mean, they make no bones about, you know, if the old fogies don't like it, we got to run them out of here. Like they'll make no bones about that. You know, oh, they're holding up the show. We've got to get them out of here. Okay. So that they reject the religion, the Christianity of our forefathers. But not only that, all fear is dismissed and frowned upon. I want you to see that. Look at, look at what the Lord has to say. Job 31. Job 31. Look what Job said. Um, For destruction from God was a terror to me. And by reason of his highness, I could not endure. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. You know what Job was saying there? Job was saying, um, you know, um, he said, I'm really afraid that, that God will, will deal with me if I, if, if I don't do right. He said, I'm really afraid God's going to do something to me. Do you believe that? And, and you know what's ridiculous is most Christians would come up to me and say, are we supposed to feel that way? And the answer is yes. And that is so far from modern day Christians thinking. They're not afraid of God. I had a guy take me to task in an airplane one day, no less, a Christian. And, and we were in this little tiny plane and I had preached in a, in a, in a remote area and he was flying me back out. And I preached to the kids about, um, about the fear of God. And, um, and he was a good guy and I love him and he's still a good guy. He's a great guy. But he said, Brother Newman, I, I really think you just, you really stretch that. Well, we're going to look at a few verses, and, and, and you're going to understand one thing by the time we're done with these verses. I, I didn't come anywhere near stretching it. But he said, you know, Brother Joe, I, I, don't, I, I think that just means reverential awe. And my first question is, can you please show me that phrase in the Bible? I would be interested to see that. But I see the word fear over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. In fact, the Bible makes a distinction in Hebrews. It says, let us serve God with reverence and godly fear. God separates the two. But I want you to see Psalm 119 and look at verse. We're going to fly. We're, we, we need to get done here. Psalm 119, verse 120. Look what David said. David was the, the man after God's own heart. David is the guy that's praising God off the chart over and over and over. And he's praying and he's, he's, he's just blessed by the Lord. Thy comforts within me delight my soul. He, he's, just, he's just in love with the Lord. But look what he said in Psalm 119, verse 120. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid. 
of thy righteous judgments. You think he missed it? You think? Go to Isaiah 66. And again, I have some verses that I'm not reading. So I'm just trying to give you a general idea tonight. Isaiah 66. The Lord is speaking very favorably in this verse to a particular group. And here's how he describes him in Isaiah 66, verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you and that cast you out for my name's sake said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. What did he call them? Ye that tremble at his word. And God says, man, I got a blessing for you. It's coming. Um, look at, um, I, I, when you get a chance, maybe tonight when you go home, Read Job 28. The whole chapter talks about where is wisdom found. And, and Job goes to this big, long thing through like 28 verses. And he says, the eye has not seen it. And the vulture has not seen it. And the, and the rivers have not seen it. And he talks about all these places where people have tried to hunt for wisdom. And then the last, the whole chapter is about that. The last verse says, behold, the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And depart from evil is understanding. Look at um, Luke 150. So people would say, well, pastor, you know, that whole fear in the Lord thing, that's an Old Testament concept. Okay. So with that in mind, let's look at a couple of verses. Luke 150. Luke 150. This is the prophecy. Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost uh, in, this, uh, in this chapter here. Um, but you see, um, you see uh, Elizabeth also is filled with the Holy Ghost, and she begins to speak in verse 41, 42. And she comes down to verse 50, and look what she says. And his mercy is on them that fear him. From generation to generation. And somebody would say, well, you know, Pastor, she was still sort of more or less under that Old Testament system. Okay, go to Acts chapter 9. Man, it just, it just really doesn't matter where you look. It's all over the place. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. And walking, how? In the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. There it is, the churches. Look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, you have the story of the seven sons of Sceva, and they were exorcists, you know, and the, they try to cast out this devil, and the devil jumps on them and beats them up, and they run out of the house naked and wounded. And, um, and uh, that would have almost been fun to watch, but Acts, Acts 19, uh, you know what I mean. Acts chapter 19, verse 17. Acts chapter 19, verse 17. It says, And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And... Fear fell in them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. I want you to see one to a church, and that's in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. You know what fear does? Fear keeps you out of trouble. You know, if you're afraid that, um, you know, something is going to, if you're afraid of a penalty, if you're afraid of something, um, you know, it, you know, only... The Bible says the fool rages and is confident. You know, there are people that are fearless, but it's really because they're, they're very foolish. Uh, you know, you ever seen that sticker in the back of a window, no fear? The transgression of the wicked saith there is no fear of God before their eyes. And um, boy, I remember as a kid, you know, the fear, the fear of my teachers, that was back when they could still paddle you. Um, I remember the fear of, of, of the fear of my dad. Um, and my dad loved me and I loved him. You guys know all about that. And, but you know what? It just kept me out. Of, did I get in trouble? Sure. But it kept me out of, I never even got close to the real deep, dark trouble, trouble. 
Because I got in so much trouble for little stuff, I didn't even want to go there. You know what it did? It, I learned the fear of the Lord. Um, did I have a great relationship with my dad? I did. Did I love my dad? I did. But you know what? I feared him. And that fear kept me from evil. You know what it says in Proverbs? By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. If you believe, God, have you ever looked at what God did to people that, that just ignored him in the Bible? Have you ever looked at that? You ever seen how he dealt with them? Look at Ephesians 5. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't end there. It says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Man, we can look at some other verses. Um, you know, there, you've, got these, this, you've got this thing in, this, you know, in, a, uh, in some sectors of Christianity where they really try to take away all these, what they perceive as negative elements. And, um, and you know, the Christianity is not Bible Christianity. It's not real. When fear is dismissed and frowned upon. And I want to give you the last one tonight. And that is, you know that um, Christianity Something is crowded into people's Christianity when a negative experience becomes their measuring stick and it fills their vision forever and ever. Um, you know, a lot of modern day Christianity is built on somebody's bad experience. And you can go onto websites, you know, you got all these people, you know, and I'm sure it's not just the, the independent fundamental Baptist. I'm just familiar with them. Uh, oh, I know it's not. I, I've, I've seen I've seen some reform groups, man. They've got their haters and and uh, every group has their haters and. And, uh, and, you know, it's all about somebody had a bad experience. That experience might have been real. It might have been terrible. But you know what happens is it then fills their vision forever and ever. And their whole life becomes defined by that bad experience they had. I remember witnessing to a guy in a mall. Came up to him. He was, he was, uh, looked like he was about 20. And I sat down beside him and tried to witness to him. And he looked at me and he said, um, with... You know, sort of hatred in his eyes. He said, I was molested at a Christian camp. And he walked off. Would I minimize what happened to him? Absolutely not. But he's got to get past that. He's got to get past that. He can't. I met, I met somebody, a, 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 sort of an old friend, if I can use that term. I, I, an acquaintance. We heard, we heard about him just recently. He goes to a church in the heart of the city. And he says, I, I like to go to a church. He said, they, they preach the gospel, but they're very progressive. And we know this dude. You know what that means? They're very they preach the gospel, but they welcome the folks and the practices of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, well, pastor, that's terrible. It is terrible. So you're not going to go quite that far, are you? So where are you going to draw your line? Are you going to draw this line? Or are you going to draw this line? Which line are you going to draw? You know, when a negative, you listen to me, and it's crept into, it's crept into even our kind of churches. You have this thing where Christianity must deal with everybody's negative experience. So all of a sudden, Christianity becomes psychotherapy. But again, when you begin to examine it, it's really strange. They have the, they have the, the divorcees Sunday school class. They have the, um, you know, they have... They have this, this, this group for these people that were mistreated. But, they're, they're, you know, they have their, oh, listen, I'm not knocking this. Please, please hear me out. But they have their, they'll have their addictions group. But you know why they have that? I, I know, I know a lot of their hearts in the right place. Okay, I understand that. But, but do you know 
What's wrong with that is because they're only dealing with fashionable problems. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? Oh, you'll notice they don't have a ministry for child molesters. Nobody gets up and says, and tonight the wife beaters class will be in room 2B. And the suicide group meets in the basement. You'll notice they only address things that are fashionable. Pray tell. Can you ever find our Lord doing any of that? Can you find Paul and Peter and any of them doing that? No! Because this was enough. This was enough. When this isn't enough, you're drifting into here. Don't ever forget that. This will always be enough. It always has been. It always will be. It meets every need. It answers every problem. It changes every life. This is enough. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for truth. Please bless it, Lord, we pray. God, help us, Lord, in a world that is rapidly trying to turn Christianity into something that it is not. Lord, I pray you'd help us. Lord, we are pressed, and we hear things, and we see things. And, and Lord, we have friends that are in all these places. And, Lord, they're, they're good people. They're not, they're not all bad people, Lord. But, Lord, they're pressing us. And, Lord, they're trying to suggest to us that we no longer have the right kind of Christianity. Lord, in Jesus' name, would you help us, Lord, that we would be the same kind of Christians, Lord, that you used to turn a pagan world upside down. Lord, may we be the kind of Christians that you had in mind. And may our church always be that. And God, we ask for your blessing. We pray you'd multiply us. And we pray, Lord, it would be alive with thy presence. And Lord, may we always stay low. Lord, may we never pat ourselves on the back about how right we are. Because God, the only thing we have is thee. And Lord, you saved us and you opened our eyes. And we are nothing without thee. May we always and forever remember that. Lord, may we love these people. May we not count them as enemies, but may we admonish them as brothers. But Lord, help us and help our children. And God, may we be able to see clearly. In Jesus' name, if God has spoke to you tonight, why don't you talk to him?
Lord, thank you for your truth. Lord, bless as we go our ways. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.